Good afternoon. I hope everybody can uh, hear us. I know it. We have a bit of a echo challenge, but hopefully, when we get Heather rolling, that will uh, no longer be a problem. My name is Drew Bennett. I'm the director of the Software uh, Licensing Group here in the Office of Innovation Partnerships, formerly known as Tech Transfer. Those of you who have not uh, caught up with our rebranding, but we are really excited this afternoon to have Heather Meeker join us and. Um, have a conversation on some academic specific considerations as it relates to open source. So just uh, excited to get that conversation going. Certainly on the front end of it, just wanna remind everybody, we're here to help you with your innovation as the Office of Innovation Partnerships. The University of Michigan is proud to be the largest public research institution in the US and to be a center of innovation and support for all of the great work that's being done across the university and all our schools and colleges. Just a bit of a reminder of all, all the great things that have uh, started out of Michigan. These are some recent ones here on the NASCAR slide, so to speak. But um, our group really works around three primary areas. One is alliances, so trying to be connective fabric between various innovators across campus and companies that are looking to do work. The licensing team that uh, my colleague Ashwathi and I are, are on to help facilitate that dialogue as well as licensing with partners. And then our venture group, which is specifically dedicated to uh, helping with startups that are based on Michigan technology. So we're here to help you create impact. Please remember us as you move through your process of innovation. We'll have a little bit more to say on that at the end, but without further ado, I am beyond excited <laughs> to have Heather with us today. This is really, really fantastic. Um, when people ask me anything about open source, I generally point them to either Heather's uh, website and or as I like to say, she wrote the book on it. And I've probably distributed more copies of uh, open, for, open source for business than I, I care to uh, remember, but that's a phenomenal book for people who wanna learn more. And she's really been on the forefront of open source from a legal point of view, a business point of view. And certainly I think that'll be integrated in today's discussion. She's a general partner at OSSC Capital and she can tell you a little bit more about that, but fundamentally a uh, uh, venture capital group that's super focused on open source. And as is always the case, when we have a presentation here at a university, she comes with the uh, academic credentials as well. Went to law school out East that people have heard of uh for a ba and then as uh I, I like to think of cal berkeley our sister school in berkeley uh same colors go bears <laughs> and uh excited to have heather with us today so without further ado i'm going to turn over the controls heather to you and uh, look forward to learning a lot today at the end we will have uh, questions and answers so please feel free to send those to the q a resource and we'll facilitate that discussion and Kind of back to the book for people who uh, hang out we're going to do a quick raffle at the end for uh the book and we'll get that to you so heather uh thank you so much for being with us and we look forward to learning thank you drew um it's a pleasure to be talking here today i would like to encourage everybody to ask lots of questions um going to leave some time at the end, but please feel free to put questions in during the presentation too, because I don't mind um, veering sideways in order to get your questions answered. Um, so uh, I will uh, share my screen here. All right, that looks good, I think. Uh, do the slideshow. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? All right, I'm gonna assume yes. Okay, great. Well, um, again, thanks everybody for uh, joining. Well, I've got a question already. Where are I, Where am I zooming from? I'm in Oakland, California, um, very near my law school alma mater, Berkeley. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of overcast day here. <laughs> so thanks for the question. Um, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, logistically didn't work out, but I'm still very happy to be talking to you today. Um, so before I get started, just a little bit about me. I've, I've been a lawyer for about 30 years now working in Silicon Valley. And uh, 
And recently I joined a venture capital, um, OSS Capital uh, Fund, uh, which exclusively uh, focuses on uh, early stage commercial open source development. So when I'm uh, talking about some of this stuff, you'll see that a lot of it is informed by both my legal practice and uh, my experience dealing with the portfolio companies. So let's get going. Okay, uh, a little overview. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about open source licenses. I'm not going through a full tutorial on it, just sort of the basic strokes. So we all sort of using the same terms. I'm gonna talk about how um, different ways to fund open source projects that um, you know you might have come across, you might not have thought about. I'm going to talk about some special considerations for academic projects um, on a, a topic on which I'm sure many of you know more than I do. So please share your knowledge in the questions. Um, and then I'm going to talk about building businesses around open source and licensing models for commercial uh, open source software. Uh, by the way, my venture fund, as I mentioned, focuses on commercial open source development. And the way that we look at that is um, companies who would not exist but for the existence of, of a core open source project. So not just companies that use open source software, but usually companies that are uh, primarily managing an open source project that is the center of their business. Uh, and that's that's what we refer to as cost. It's kind of our own term, but that's how we think about our own uh, investment thesis. Okay, so let's talk about open source licenses first. As I promised, this is going to be a whirlwind um, uh, explanation, but um, uh, people sometimes think that open source is complicated because there are so many open source licenses, and it's kind of true, but it's kind of not true as well. There are hundreds of open source licenses. Over 100 have been approved by the Open Source Initiative, but um, there are really only six that anybody uses with any frequency. So if you understand those six, then you understand open source licensing. The rest is a very, very long tail. You'll see on this slide, there are three in red and there are three in gold. And um, I've also cheated a little bit and put three different licenses in the last bullet. That's because they are almost identical. Um, uh, these are roughly in the order of frequency of use. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell and to tell how you should weight it and so forth, but uh, this is sort of the conventional wisdom about how often um, licenses are used. So the ones in red are what we call copyleft licenses. Some people refer to those as viral licenses. I I don't think that's a good term because it's actually kind of misleading. It 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 makes people come to conclusions that they probably should have come to. Um, the ones in gold are uh, permissive licenses. So we've got the general public license, which is the quintessential uh, copyleft license, as you might know. Uh, GPL version two covers the Linux kernel. So uh, that was sort of the uh, progenitor of the free software movement it's embodied in this license. There's BSD, MIT, and Apache, which are permissive licenses. And although they look a little different, they are substantively very similar. Um, and then there's the lesser general public license or LGPL, which is a lot like GPL, but uh, it's intended for libraries rather than whole programs. Uh, it was, by the way, originally called the Library General Public License, but then they changed it to lesser for some political reasons. Uh, but it's easy to remember that it's for libraries because it starts with L. And then the final ones are Eclipse, CDDL, and Mozilla, which are all quite similar and, um, and, and share some of the same provenance in their drafting. Uh, and those are sometimes referred to as the weak copyleft licenses. Um, Mozilla in particular was made for plugins to the uh, Mozilla browser, which is now the Firefox browser. And so it is intended to make it easy to combine proprietary code with open source code. 
Uh, so the, that's open source. And if you understand how these licenses work, you understand open source. There are two philosophies of open source. There's the free software, you know, kind of embodied in the copyleft idea, and there's the permissive. And I have a couple of, uh, of images on this slide. Uh, the feather is the logo of the Apache Foundation, which is a foundation that has lots of extremely important projects. Uh, undoubtedly, every single one of us is using Apache um, software right now. <laughs> uh, because it, it forms part of the backbone of the web. And uh, Apache uh, represents sort of the laissez-faire permissive approach. Um, all projects that are under the Apache Foundation are under Apache version 2 license, and that is a permissive license. And then there's the, the GNU, which is uh, the logo of the Free Software Foundation, uh, which um, created the GNU project, uh, the GNU project is, um, is uh, if you take the Linux kernel and then you want to create a distribution around it, you need the GNU tools. So it's part of a uh, Linux distribution. And um, Free Software Foundation was the original drafter of the general public license. So their uh, sort of political focus is copyleft or free software. And then the Apache uh, uh, represents more of the open source or permissive approach. So here's, a, here's the MIT license. I'll observe a few things about it. One is it's short enough to fit on one slide, which is really short. <laughs> um, the other is uh, it is maybe not what we would call a model of drafting. Um, <laughs> uh, it's easy to be a critic, of course, but uh, it, the, the, the license grant doesn't look like a normal license grant. Um, it uh, is not clear about what patent rights it grants. That's been a source of ongoing controversy over the years. I'll, I'll also um, observe that it's what we call a template license. So it, you see copyright and then in, in uh, brackets year and copyright holders. So basically, Everyone who uses this is supposed to fill in that information. They don't always do it, by the way, but they should. And that's that's a, a copyright notice as you know, as described in the copyright law. So it'd be copyright 2022, Heather Meeker, if I uh, if I released some software under this license. Um, and the only requirement of this license is that if you distribute the software, you have to include a copy of this license with the software. Uh, you can license your software under any terms you like, but you have to include this as a notice, which functions just to inform people that your whatever you're distributing has software under this license under it. So that's permissive. Copyleft is more complicated. And I like to say that uh, if there were only permissive licenses, I wouldn't have had the same career I've had because I've spent a lot of my time explaining copyleft to people. But when it comes down to it, it's not really all that complicated. Um, there are a couple of conditions, or there's a condition with two parts, really. If you distribute software in binary form, you have to make the corresponding source code available to binary recipients. And that, um, uh, and, and, and you can only license on the same terms as the copyright license. That's why some people call this viral, uh, because the, the license terms kind of stick to the software, no matter how many times they pass, the software passes from one person to another who might change it and downstream to another. So that's how copyleft works. It, it, it applies to the original software that's under the license and also any modifications that you make to it. The reason, that you have to provide the corresponding source code or the um, you know modified source code is so that a recipient can uh, have the source code that corresponds to the binaries that they have. This is part of the sort of political, moral, technological philosophy of free software, which is that anybody who has software should have access to be able to fix it and improve it if they want. So that means they have to have access to the source code. Um, one thing I like to mention is that if you're distributing software and source code in the first place, you don't have these obligations because you've already fulfilled them. And um, 
certainly some of you know, maybe not all of you know that there is some software that doesn't even have a binary form that's separate from source code. So um, in, in many kinds of software today, um, it's very easy to fulfill these requirements. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to fund open source projects. Um, by the way, if if you have questions about open source licenses and copyleft and so forth, please feel free to uh, to add them and, and I'll talk about them. I just didn't want to necessarily um, go on about that when the focus of the talk is how to um, be successful with open source projects in, um, uh, in an academic setting. Um, so, there are lots of ways to fund open source pro projects. Okay, one thing that's not on this slide because it's impossible with open source is by um, getting royalties for the software license. Um, you, open source licenses are all royalty free. And so you cannot make money licensing open source software per se. Um, we'll talk about some of the ways that um, you can make money in the area around the open source license. There are plenty of ways to do that, but the open source license itself will not make you any money. So if you're, uh, created, you've created an open source project and you want to fund it, how, how do you get the, the funding and resources to uh, keep it going? Um, this is a, right now, is a huge policy issue, by the way. You may have noticed that uh, the White House has been issuing some um, executive orders about this. There is currently a bill that's been introduced in the Senate about open source security. People are, mo are particularly interested today uh, about um, how we keep open source software secure. And that's because open source software is everywhere and security issues in it affect potentially the whole world. Um, so if you have open source projects that are not well-funded and don't have good resources, the first thing you find is that they get outdated and possibly insecure. So funding is a, a very important uh, issue uh, in open source, and there are various ways to go about it. So the first is that sometimes people just work on open source projects because it's like a labor of love. They, it's like self-funding. They give of their own time to work on it. And this is how open source projects usually start, actually. Um, they, uh, so that means there's kind of no funding or uh, in, a, in a way, the person who is doing the development is um, giving of their own time and perhaps forgoing other income in order to put the open, to make the open source uh, software uh, available and, uh, and to work on it. <clears throat> okay, but that of course, creates a big burden on the developers. And, um, and when everyone is using the software, maybe that maybe that's kind of not fair, but that's, that's the way open source works. So if you want to actually get resources to fund an open source project, how do you do that? Well, there, there um, is, uh, uh, sometimes people get grants from nonprofits to develop open source software. And if you're in an academic setting, you might be more familiar with this path of getting funding for activities. Um, I would say this is not a huge category in open source, mainly because some of the other uh, categories are so big, um, but uh, occasionally nonprofits will grant, um, will give funds uh, on the uh, condition that whatever is um, comes out of the development is released under an open source license. <laughs> Excuse me. In fact, I've represented a couple of nonprofits that have done uh, funding agreements that have required that the software that comes out of uh, out of the project be released under an open source license. So that's one route. Another is government funding. Um, the U.S. is a little bit behind the curve in, I would say, in preferring open source software. There are some other places in the world where uh, they have already expressed a preference for open source software in government procurement. Um, at this point in the US, we are leaning towards that more, but it's taken us a little while. Um, so now if you want to do a, a government uh, contract, um, it's very likely that you might be talking to the government about creating open source software. Um, 20 years ago, that was definitely not the case. Um, 
but government funding of open source definitely happens. And um, you'll see in the executive order that's mentioned down there um, a little bit more about how that's developing. Um, I expect that we're going to be seeing more about the intersection of open source and government um, in the future. Uh, and the bill that was recently introduced also um, had to do with uh, creating a structure to oversee what uh, open source software government was using and to keep it secure. So government funding is another option. Um, then there are foundations, and I would say this is the biggest source of funding, and uh, it's not exactly the foundation, the foundations who are funding the projects, it's more their members who are funding them. So you may have heard of the Linux Foundation. Uh, there was the Apache Foundation that I mentioned as well. Um, and these are organizations that sponsor open source projects. So if you have an open source project, and you want to run it through a not-for-profit entity, you go and become a, a project of one of these organizations, and the members of the organization um, pay uh, money that gets earmarked for your project. So what you do is you go to the foundation, uh, they, they accept you as a project, and then when people contribute money, you go out and you get funding, usually from corporations, the corporations pay the money to the foundation and they earmark the money for you. Um, they charge a, uh, you know, a, they charge basically a fee for that um, in order to manage the finances of the project. And they, and they also provide some infrastructure and some other benefits. But foundations have been emerging as one of the main ways that open source projects are funded uh, these days. Um, then there are corporate resources. Um, and so actually a lot of big open source projects today come out of big companies. So if you look at all the big tech companies like Google and LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, a bunch of others, right? Um, they create a lot of open source software and they release a lot of open source software. And, and a lot of that open source software then develops a life of its own. So what's happening there is that these projects are being essentially funded by the corporation's resources, human resources, and then uh, and then they might get rolled into a foundation or they might uh, get uh, taken over by somebody else. Um, often what happens is that uh, the, the uh, original developers of the project want to take it forward as their own business enterprise. And that's when we come to the last category, uh, which is commercial open source software. So um, sometimes that comes out of a corporation, sometimes it comes out of the first bullet, just self-funding. Uh, but uh, when that happens, there's an open source project and in a very conventional way, the, the project forms a company, goes out and gets private money to, uh, in, to uh, develop the project either venture money or angel money or what have you, and they build a business around it, which eventually becomes self-funding. So these are all ways in which uh, open source projects get funded out in real life. So if you have an academic project, um, there are some things you should think about. And uh, I'm sure that, for instance, uh, Drew and um, Aswathi will uh, also have their own ideas about some of this. Um, uh, you know, they they might uh, they might underscore a couple of things I'll say. But the first thing to do is to understand your university's IP policies. Um, so different universities have different approaches to claiming rights in software developed by their employees, which would include professors graduate students who are employed by the university and, and researchers who are employed by the university. If you go back uh, 30 years, um, most universities were not too interested in rights to software. And that's mainly because, you know, you go back far enough and, and the rights in software were not really considered all that interesting from a commercial point of view. As software has gotten more uh, valuable, uh, the universities have started to uh, develop policies about ownership of software. 
Now, this is um, uh, has happened somewhat slowly because um, traditionally universities have not claimed interest in copyrightable works that their like professors create because you know, if you think of traditional copyrightable works like academic papers, um, they they actually wanted the professors to go and publish and they didn't claim any rights in that. And they still usually don't claim any rights in that. But when it comes to other kinds of copyrightable works that are more commercial in nature, like software, the university is likely to claim ownership of software that you create within the uh, within the context of employment and so the first thing you have to understand is what rights you might have or might not have to release your software under an open source license or any other terms that you might be interested in using. Um, uh, normally, you would have to talk to your um, Office of Technology Licensing about that. Um, and your university might have preferences as to what license that you might use uh, and whose um, uh, permission or approval you need in order to do a release. Um, and then you need to understand your patent position. So similarly, uh, universities will claim uh, rights in patentable inventions that are created by their employees. And so uh, you need to understand whether you're going to need licenses from your university in order to use the software. Again, if you go back uh, even 30 years, um, patent rights and software were not considered interesting. Or if you talk to some people, they, you will, they will say they didn't exist. I don't think that's quite right. I just think they weren't very common or very valuable. Um, but, but at this point, you may need to understand separately from the rights in the software, which basically copyright rights, whether you need to get your um, university's approval to use patentable inventions that are embodied in the software. And again, you need to talk to your Office of Technology Licensing about how you go about that. Um, universities have, um, you know, just about all of them have, um, uh, you know, well-settled policies about dealing with patent licensing and, and particularly to professors and other employees who are going to engage in commercial activities. And so uh, you need to understand how all of that works. Um, it, it's not a good idea to go releasing open source software without understanding these things, because you can actually do things that are contrary to your university's position. And um, having run into that a couple of times as a diligence issue in uh, investment deals, I can tell you that is a very bad place to be. Uh, because you will need to clean up that issue before you can get um, any serious investors in a commercial venture that you were going to do um, using software that was developed uh, on university time or using university resources. Um, if you are involved in an academic project, um, you know, you legitimately ask yourself, do I expect commercialization at all? Because um, you know, so, of course, some open source projects are, are never commercial projects. They're more like research projects or they're more just academic projects that people don't expect to make money from. And so, um, you know, if you, if you expect the software to be commercialized, you need to think about it in a different way from if, from if you expect it not to be commercialized. You might use a different license. You might think about it different kinds of funding approaches and, and so forth. So um, you should know what your goals are and what the, uh, you know, the best use of the software will be. And you should also uh, understand what intellectual property policies your university has so that you don't um, run afoul of them. I've got a question here, thank you. Um, for academic projects, is there a meaningful advantage to releasing software under a permissive license just dedicating versus just dedicating it to the public domain? Do funders prefer one to the other? That's a really good question. Um, I'm a big fan of public domain, by the way, um, and, and I'll explain why. Um, a permissive license, um, you know, it allows anybody to do anything they like with the software with only one requirement, and that is that they have to put a notice, a license notice on it if they redistribute it. 
there are some situations in which putting that license notice on, on a distributed product can be actually very burdensome. And it, it might not it might not seem that way, but you know, think about uh, like the sort of the classic uh, the classic idea of the Linux toaster, right? So you've got a toaster. It's it's for some reason got a Linux operating system in it because it's a fancy toaster. And where are you going to put those license notices? Well, that's really difficult. When, whenever you're in a situation like Internet of Things. Um, any kind of uh, equipment where there's no uh, user interface, license notices can actually become extremely burdensome for people. So if you really want to make your software available for the broadest use, you might not want to require anybody to use a notice. And usually the way you do that is by dedicating it to the public domain. Now, there is, I would say, a little bit of controversy, although... I would consider it kind of a paper tiger. And that is that um, in places outside the United States, most particularly Europe, there is a notion that you cannot dedicate copyrights to the public domain. The reason for that, as I'm given to understand, I'm certainly not an expert, is that um, copyright is a uh, it's like a moral right, a personal right. And, and those kinds of rights cannot be given away or sold, um, it, almost like a civil right. And so in Europe, um, they're much more skeptical about public domain dedications than in the US. In the US, it's generally thought to work fine. Um, I would say as a risk management issue, it always works fine, But because uh, I've never heard of anyone actually enforcing rights in something that they've, they have taken a step to dedicate to the public domain. So um, uh, it can be a good choice, um, but you, know, you, you might find people who object to it. Now, I will also say that if what you're developing is something that is not really a copyrightable work or is on the bleeding edge of what is a copyrightable work, like not software, but say data or um, a machine learning model, you know, that's a, a really big issue now. You should really think whether you want to burden that with the requirement to, you know, have license notices and take copyright licenses. And if you don't, then um, public domain can be a great, um, approach. Now there is, uh, by the way, there's a license called Creative Commons Zero, which is a public domain dedication. And it, it's a it's public domain dedication with a kind of a backup license. So it says, this is dedicated to the public domain. And if you think that's not enforceable, here's a broad license. Uh, in any case, um, I am a big fan of public domain. All right. Let's talk about how to release your software for maximum impact. By the way, um, I don't know how to dismiss, uh, I, I, I should be able to, to keep track of the Q&A, um, but uh, uh, if, uh, there we go, okay, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> it's been dismissed. Um, so let's talk about releasing your software for maximum impact. Okay, so if you have a, a software development project and you want to release it, there are some things that you should think about before, you know, putting it out there in the wild. Um, the first is um, sanitizing it. So I'll step back for a moment and say there, there are at least a couple of ways to do open source code development and release. One is that you develop the software on your own and then you release it. The other is that you just develop it in the open, right? So there's usually some point at which a developer decides, okay, this is this is ready to put in a GitHub repository or otherwise make it public. Um, it's it's usually not from the first line, but different open source projects use different approaches to the amount that they develop in the in in the open uh, versus a waterfall kind of release. So these are things to consider before doing the waterfall. One is sanitizing the code. So when you write code, you might put things in the comments and so forth that are really not 
suitable for public release. I mean, they can range anywhere from personal information to snarky comments to a whole bunch of other stuff. I I once upon a time worked at a de as a developer and I'm <laughs> well aware of this phenomenon. Um, so you want to take a look at it and make sure that anything that's just not appropriate for, for being public is taken out. The next thing to do is to check your dependencies. So if, for instance, you're developing a project under the MIT license and it has a dependency on a copyleft um, piece of software like GPL software, you really need to think about how that's going to work because people are going to see your, your project and go, oh, great, this is under permissive license. I can do anything I want with it. I don't have to worry about copyleft and, and source code sharing. And then your, your code will pull in uh, uh, other code under another license, which has more requirements. That's not a nice thing to do to your community. So you want to see, look at the licenses that are applied to your code dependencies, and you want to see, is the license that I've selected going to be appropriate? And if there's some conflict between the two, it's a good idea to explain it um, on the um, like on the the web page for your project, so that uh, so that you won't lead people into um, inadvertently uh, violating somebody else's license terms. Um, you you need to choose a license, and we'll talk about that more later on in the presentation. Um, as I said, um, it can seem a little daunting, but if we assume that we would only choose one of the six that were on that first slide then um, it's a much easier choice because there's just a narrower range of choices to make. And then you have to apply those license terms, which is basically sticking them in a license.txt file and putting them in your code release. You have to decide where you're going to release the code. Now today, like almost all open source code is on GitHub, which is an online source code repository. Um, has lots of open source software on it. Um, but if you're doing an academic project, you might have a preference to uh, make the code available um, over your own website or some other way. Um, I would say for corporate and for hobbyist uh, open source development, it's almost always GitHub these days. Academic projects tend a little bit more to be on uh, private web pages, meaning web pages of the university. Uh, so figure out where the project is going to live. Um, you need to figure out who is going to curate community contributions. One of the reasons people use GitHub so much is that it's a, it's a system for uh, uh, getting suggestions, approving suggestions, and merging them into your software. Uh, but uh, it's a lot of work, or potentially a lot of work if there's a vibrant community to uh, to figure out what software needs to go into the, I'm sorry, which contribution should go into the code base and which should not. And um, related to that, who will maintain the project? So who's going to put the sweat equity into maintaining the project, keeping it up to date and keeping it, uh, uh, keeping it robust? And that can be a lot of work. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, another question on licenses. Could you discuss issues around permissive and open source licenses for software that is export controlled? That's a great question. So um, in the United States, we have um, control over export of software. Um, we don't have so much control over import of software, although there can be concerns about that. I'm just gonna lay that aside for a moment because that tends to be specific to you know, particular political situations. But Generally, we have a regulatory uh, regime for export of software. And in the US, we have two uh, basic regimes. We have the general um, Department of Commerce regulations, and then we have the Department of Defense regulations. So the main issue on export of software, I'm gonna lay aside general embargoes, you know, and so forth. Like there are, there are certain countries to which you cannot provide any product, right, because they're embargoed. But that list is actually pretty short. Um, it, laying that aside, 
um, there are pr particular types of goods that get regulated more than others. Okay, so the one that is most important for software is um, cryptography software. The cryptography is regulated by the Department of Defense. It's considered like a weapon. And so um, you might have, you're going to have more issues with export if you are um, distributing software that has a strong, uh, strong cryptography in it. Um, now, generally there is an exception to the Department of Commerce regulations for software that is made available publicly in source code form. By the way, that is not exactly identical to open source, but there's an enormous overlap. And in order to take advantage of that exception, you have to um, you have to do a, a filing. It's, it's a fairly trivial kind of filing that you have to do, basically. I think you just send an email to someone at Department of Commerce. I don't remember exactly how you do it, but not a difficult thing to do at all. So um, as a consequence, um, what drives the complexity of exporting software is not really exactly which license you use, but whether you make the source code publicly available. If you do, then you're going to have a lot less trouble. And if your software is not uh, contain strong encryption, then um, you're going to not have to deal with a, a whole swath of regulations about it. I uh, have another question here. Um, if your code is under MIT and you reference a dependency under GPL, wouldn't your code need to be under G GPL? Or does GPL only require that your software is open source and that the GPL license needs to be distributed with the software, even though yours isn't technically under GPL? Another good question. So um, if you have a dependency on GPL software, and if the nature of that dependency is that the GPL software is going to be put into the same executable process as your software, then yes, uh, it would be a violation of that license to redistribute code under something that was proprietary. But if you have a, an MIT piece and you add a GPL piece to it, you can redistribute the whole under GPL because MIT is what we call compatible with GPL. In other words, it grants rights at least as broad as GPL. So um, it's okay to do that. But the reason I said that you should be transparent about having say, you know, copy left dependencies on a permissively licensed product is that you don't want people to inadvertently not understand that and violate the rights of the upstream uh, developer who developed the GPL code. So it's okay to put MIT and GPL together. The effect is that the entire binary that gets redistributed is under GPL but your piece could stay under MIT, which it would be separately available under MIT. Uh, so it can be done, but if you are bringing in dependencies with copyleft licenses, you might consider using a copyleft license yourself, or if you don't, uh, you need to inform your community about how it's working because um, otherwise uh, they're gonna get confused about that and make mistakes. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on. Thank you for the questions. So now we're going to talk about bu building businesses around open source or commercial open source software. Okay, so people ask me pretty regularly, like how can you possibly make money with open source software? It's free. And on a certain level, that's true. By the way, I don't get that question as much anymore. And the reason is, there have been some fantastically successful open source companies uh, in the last few years. And so it's clear that you can make money with it. That's why we have our venture fund. Uh, but how can be like a little bit less than intuitive. So the main thing is if you wanna make money uh, around a, co a commercial open source project um, is don't be the underpants gnomes. Now, I don't know how many of you are South Park fans. But uh, there was an episode, um, by the way, I don't think the episode was all that great except for this particular meme, uh, but uh, 
um, they they went around they stole underpants from people and when they were asked why they said well we have a three phase plan phase one collect underpants uh, phase three profit but they didn't know what phase two was and sometimes when I talk to people who want to make open source into a business they have a kind of an underpants no mentality <laughs> like they think that they're magically going to get from uh, open source project to a profitable business. There's a lot in between that you need to figure out. It's definitely possible to do, but you need to be thoughtful about it. You need to have a plan for it and your licensing uh, needs to be consistent with that plan. So we're going to talk about what that phase two is and how, how companies get from one place to another. So, um, you also might recall some my illusions certainly date me a lot, but you might recall that there was a, a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? The, the book was about, um, you know, changing jobs and life choices and so forth. And the it asked, what color is your parachute in order to make people think concretely about how they were making a plan to do some, something. So open source uh, commercial open source software businesses are all, to some extent, what I would call razor blades models. So famously, King Gillette of the shaving company um, said, or at least was claimed to have said, um, uh, give them the razor, sell them the razor blades. So in other words, you're giving something away. And you were selling another thing. And those things were, in economic terms, complementary uh, goods or services, you know, in this case. So if you're going to develop an open source business model, you need to understand what your razor blades are. And the better you understand that, the better you're going to be able to get from A to B in a sensible way. So here are some of the... Um, some of the different uh, approaches that businesses take to uh, making money uh, around an open source project. And again, I'm talking about businesses that would not exist but for a specific open source project. So they're not just you, they're not just hoovering up other people's work. They're actually putting time, effort, and money into developing the open source project and managing it. So the most obvious model and and the one that you know people started out with mostly was maintenance and support so you would give the software away under an open source license and then you would charge for really support rather than maintenance because everybody gets updates for free with open source um and this was a model that was good for developers who wanted a job you know doing what they loved and um, but the problem with it is that it's not a very scalable model because support is a human intensive activity. And so mostly outside investors will not be interested in investing in this model. This is a great model for if you want, you know, a small business for yourself to make an income, maybe employ a couple of other people, but it's it's not a scalable business. So um, this one is certainly doable, but it's not the way you create an enormous business. Oops, I'm gonna, okay. The next is um, quality control. So this is actually a pretty good business. <laughs> um, and you'll see there the pet rock. Okay, so again, an illusion in which I date myself, but um, you know, this was a fad during, I guess, the 1970s, early 1980s, and it was a rock <laughs> with some eyes glued to it, and the, and they sold millions of these things. The guy who it, who created this made a ton of money, um, and so that seems kind of idiotic, right? Because uh, um, it, it certainly was uh, uh, sold for more than the cost of the little eyes and the packaging. Um, but one thing about it was that the rocks were not just any rocks. They were actually rocks that were taken from a particular Mexican beach and they were, you know, they were nice and round and they were of a certain size and so forth. So in a way, what this was, um, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I like the comment. The gimmick for the pet rock was the instruction manual. <laughs> exactly. So, so it wasn't really the rock that was being sold. It was like all of the QC around it and packaging it up into a nice product. Okay, so that might sound silly, but actually it makes a lot of sense because if you think about what people buy when they buy software, they don't buy source code. Source code isn't even a product. Source code is a tool to build a product. And so there's actually good money to be made to be made um, with quality control and with um, uh, you know making the 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 open source code into a product that actually works in business. Like if I'm a CTO and I'm thinking of buying a product in order to solve some problem I have in my business, um, in a way, like it's it's great to have the source code, but I don't want the source code. I want something to solve my problem, right? So, um, and this model is basically Red Hat, right? Red Hat, an enormous business, which was you know sold for uh, billions and billions of dollars a few years ago. Um, what they do is they basically do quality control of Linux. Now, the reason it works for them is that Linux is the biggest open source project in the world. You know, so the traditional wisdom from the business side about this is there's only one red hat because uh, they've got the biggest product uh, project and they're the leading uh, distribution. Uh, but but there is money to be made doing this, and it, it's just that you pretty much have to do it at scale or else you're not going to be making a lot of money doing it. So margins are lower in this model than in some others. Next, there's online services. And um, so uh, this is an interesting category because uh, tr like the the examples I have on here are are uh, GitHub and um, and WordPress. Um, it used to be that this was considered more like a small to medium business model. And WordPress is a quintessential example of that. So WordPress is a great open source project. Um, it is, uh, it, and the company WordPress.com is uh, controlled by the original developer of, of WordPress. Um, and so uh, like I have my blog on WordPress and I could just take the source code and run it on my own, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> I would like someone else to do it for me. And so I sign up for WordPress and I you know, pay a modest fee per month. And I, I basically get the software as a service and I don't have to deal with building it on my own. So that's why this was historically considered a small to medium business model. In other words, I didn't have the resources to hire an IT person to run my own instance of WordPress. I mean, I imagine I could probably figure it out if I wanted to, but I just would rather do other things with my life. So um, this is making the software as available as a service. Now, um, this is actually a huge category in open source. And in fact, many, many companies that are, that are cost companies are making most of their money by providing their software as a service. And again, this drafts on the idea that what people want is to solve a problem. They don't necessarily want source code because source code alone doesn't solve their problem. And in fact, there's a great deal of, um, of skill in serving up a, a SaaS offering other than uh, just simply, um, you know, just simply running the software. Uh, that is uh, illustrated by GitHub, which has a lot of bells and whistles that, um, you know, just standing up the software doesn't have. So online services is a big category. Um, I'm not going to spend long on this. There are professional services. I used to have a client, for instance, that did custom Linux development, and that was a pretty good business, but also not terribly scalable because um, professional services and, and software development is is more of a human, you know, human capital question. And so it doesn't scale terribly well. Um, widget frosting, uh, there are businesses that create uh, hardware products and they make the software available open source. Um, and an example of that might be Kindle device, you know. So what they're selling is the hardware. Um, they're not selling the software. The software is just given away for free. 
This is pretty common category in IoT. And then finally, there's embargo, which is a, a sort of an interesting turn on open source business models. Um, an example of this might be Android. So um, you can have the open source software, but you give early access to paying customers and then you release the software later as open source. So this is a waterfall development model, not a developing in the open model. So you give your, your best customers who are paying you money um, access uh, and they're paying for the privilege of having early access. And it works in a category like, um, you know, uh, mobile devices because time to market is everything in that in that industry. And so um, people were willing to pay a lot of money to have the latest bells and whistles before their competitors do. So to sum all this up, uh, we got maintenance and support. And, and by the way, I, I mentioned here what the licenses are. Um, maintenance and support, uh, I would say GPL is probably most common, but it can be other things too. And the, the, the services itself, itself doesn't have any license. It's just a services agreement. Same with quality assurance. If you look at, say, Red Hat's uh, commercial agreement, it's not a license, it's a services agreement. Uh, online service, um, that uh, SaaS, that is also a service agreement uh, and then an open source license. Uh, professional services um, I, and widget frosting, I won't bother going through because um, you can use any license you like. Um, uh, and, then, and then we get to dual licensing and open core. Okay, so this is where things get a little trickier. Okay, so um, oh, which models are most profitable, scalable? So um, at the risk of, uh, of spoilers here, I would say that open core is for most companies the most successful these days, but it really depends on what sector you're in. Uh, so dual licensing was a model that uh, it developed in like the 2000s and the, uh, the granddaddy of this was MySQL, which is a database which was under GPL with this exception that didn't make any difference from a commercial point of view. Um, and the point was that the software was available under GPL, but if you wanted a different set of rights, uh, you would buy an alternative license. And MySQL at the time was in on-premises distributed products. And so you couldn't combine that with proprietary software in your product uh, and, or you would violate GPL. So you would buy your way out of that license. This is sometimes called selling exceptions. And, um, Dual licensing started with the kind of the identical twin model. So there's a picture of some very cute babies there who are um, identical twins. And then it developed into kind of a fraternal, fraternal twin model where there was a community edition and an enterprise edition. And they were uh, similar, but the, the enterprise edition had additional bells and whistles, usually those that were associated with... Um, uh, deployment at scale. Uh, so um, that turned into the fraternal twin model, which then developed into open core. And this is an extremely common model for new companies today. It's been very successful for a lot of companies. If you look at uh, companies like Confluent and Redis and originally Elastic, um, you know, all all of which are extraordinarily successful companies, um, they uh, all have this open core model. And the idea is that the core software is open source and is usually under a permissive license. And then there are add-ons that are sold only as proprietary or um, possibly within a, a SaaS product and not licensed at all. And the company is selling those add-ons to mostly to larger enterprises. In a way, this can kind of be a substitute for um, giving the product away to smaller businesses and charging to larger businesses because larger businesses are going are the ones that are going to need to uh, deploy the software at scale. And examples of that would be orchestration software, management software, um, single sign-on, you know, things that. Uh, 
people need when they're when they're they're deploying software across large large organizations. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that slide. I I had to uh, change from one uh, <laughs> format to the other, and obviously I missed one. Um, don't need to talk about it anyway. Um, Open core can have a lot of variations. Um, you can have a small core with lots of stuff around it. You can have a big core with only a little bit of stuff around it. And then you can have something that's more like the pomegranate, which is a whole bunch of little pieces of core in inside of a whole bunch of proprietary bits. So um, there, there are many, many models for this. OK. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about choosing a license. And uh, so if you're choosing a license for a project, um, there, first of all, I would say you should never choose any but those six on the first slide, because part of the reason you're choosing an open source license for your project is that you want to maximize adoption and people are more likely to adopt software that has a, a, a recognizable license. I like to refer to this as the understanding tax. You know, people will not adopt software under licenses they don't understand. And because some of these licenses are a little complicated or unusual, it usually takes a long time for people to get comfortable with them. And so you want, as far as possible, to be um, uh, leveraging the popularity of the licenses. And so if you choose any but the, the original six on those slides, then you're probably not doing yourself any favors. Um, so you basically need to make a couple of decisions. One is uh, permissive versus copyleft. And the other is uh, whether you need a patent grant. Um, some of these licenses have expressed patent grants and some don't. If you're in a highly patented area, you might actually prefer one with an express patent grant because it might actually serve to bound the patents that you're granting. Your uh, university, if the university owns the software, they might have a lot to say about that as well. They might have some preferences. So BSD, MIT, LGPL 2.1, and GPL 2 don't have express patent grants in them. AGPL, GPL, LGPL 3, Mozilla, and Apache 2 all have patent grants in them. Um, and then if you need something that's Linux kernel compatible, you have to pick something that's GPL 2 compatible. So that's also on the left-hand side. So this is sort of a, an outline for making the decision. By the way, if you go to my website, heathermeeker.com, one of the buttons on the top is a license picker. It's just a little short script that you can go through to answer some questions and it picks a license for you. You know, it's for um, entertainment purposes only, uh, but you might use it to stress test your decision. It also has some commentary about why it, it goes down different paths. By the way, that was me writing a JavaScript program, um, you know, which uh, uh, I, I try to eat my own dog food at least a little bit. Okay, we have a question. What is the deal with Elastic's new license? If we wanted to use Elastic as part of a larger architecture, what are the requirements? So um, first of all, I led the drafting on Elastic 2.0. Uh, so I won't say anything confidential <laughs> in, this, in this presentation. But the Elastic license is a new category of license that we refer to as source available. And um, actually, I think we'll just uh, go there. OK, uh, I'll go back to the other slides as needed. OK, so this is a category that is becoming more and more popular uh, because a few things have happened. First, people demand source code now. You know, if you go back 25 years, uh, customers didn't expect to get source code except maybe through a source code escrow. Today, it's actually market that you deliver source code. So there, <clears throat> you know, there was open source. <clears throat> as a category. And then there's proprietary kind of binary end user licenses or something like that as another category. And there wasn't really anything in between, which was a source code license that was standardized. And so this category has been emerging lately and it's become extremely popular. Um, I think we're just going to see more of this in the future. 
Um, for better or worse, I've worked on most of these um, because um, of my work with open source software. But these, I, I need to be clear, these are not open source licenses. They are sort of adjacent to open source licenses. They're source code licenses with some restrictions. So if you look at Redis Confluent Elastic, um, they all basically say, here's the software, do anything you want with it, except do not stand up a competing software as a service or hosted service using this software. And they were concerned about that because they, they didn't want the big um, cloud services providers to be uh, basically eating their lunch. You know? <laughs> so they wanted to have their own cloud services business and protect that. Um, so Elastic, for instance, um, is actually dual licensed under Elastic and SSPL. Um, honestly, I would say it's probably easier to comply with Elastic 2.0, so that's probably the one you're looking at. And essentially, if you're providing a service that is like a value add, like you're providing an application and then using this software um, down on the stack so that you don't expose the functionality of the software directly, um, you're probably fine with using it under that license. Um, if you were, uh, but if you're providing it as a substitute for the exact software that you're being licensed, then that's not going to be allowed. Um, so you can think of that as a value add requirement or a non-competition or um, perhaps um, uh, some other, uh, oops, sorry. Um, or perhaps another, um, uh, like don't expose a functionality. So there are various ways of looking at that. Just uh, uh, bear with me for one moment. So Elastic has a, a clause in it that some of the others don't, which is also, it says don't remove the license key from the software because there are some license keys embedded in Elastic software that require you to pay to use it. Uh, but, but Elastic wanted to apply one license to all of its code. So um, that's essentially what's going on with Elastic. It's, it's similar to some of these others. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Mongo is under the server-side public license, which is kind of a AGPL on steroids license. It, uh, it basically says if you use this to provide a hosted service, you have to make all your source code available. That's very difficult to comply with. And so most people would instead go and negotiate a commercial license with Mongo. Um, and then MariaDB, the business source license, that's gotten some traction lately. It's a bit of an oddball. Um, it says you can use a license for non-production use. Um, and then the license converts automatically within four years to a GPO, GPL compatible license. Uh, so for instance, um, what might be common for an open core business model is um, that you have a core which is under Apache 2 and you have um, add-ons which are under a, a source available license. And the example I've used there is Polyform Non-Commercial, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, Polyform was a project that was started by me and a few of my uh, agent provocateur friends who were lawyers in the open source space um, to make some template licenses for this category. Um, you know, the like the elastic license, I actually think is is a nicely drafted license. Um, the the others that were earlier on maybe a little rougher um, and and they're they're fine work product, but they are specific to those companies. So there weren't template licenses that anyone could adopt. So we we wrote this series of licenses that are very short, plain language, and it kind of kind of tracks the, uh, the Creative Commons model where you can pick and choose your restrictions. So uh, there are a number of things you can pick like non-commercial only, um, small business, free trial, et cetera. Uh, so you might take a look at those if, you, um, if, if you're interested. By the way, for the non-commercial license, we vetted that license with the University of California 
before we released it, we worked with their lawyers to make sure that University of California would be um, comfortable using software under that license. It's pretty broad, non-commercial rights, and includes the rights that you know a university might expect to want to exercise for non-commercial purposes. And then we have a couple that are more like the Elastic or Redis or Confluent licenses that are kind of like non-competition licenses. So, um, you know, take a look at those on, on the polyformproject.org website if you're interested in those. Okay, so um, I'm going to check the chat and make sure. Um, oh, I think that's just administrative stuff. Um, so um, if you would like a copy, a download, to download a copy of my book, you can download one for free. Oops, wow, I have the wrong contact information here. I'm really sorry. Um, it has my old email address. So disregard that email address because it's not right anymore. But it's super easy to find me. Just uh, go to heathermeeker.com and you'll find a way to contact me. Um, if you, if you go and you look at my website, there's a tab that says links and you can go there and, and you sign up for like the book update list, which is a mailing list I hardly ever use, only, <laughs> only when I do updates to the book, which is pretty infrequent. Um, and you can download a PDF copy of the book. Um, and then I also have lots of free videos um, as I say, courtesy of COVID-19 and shelter in place, because everybody reacts to going stir crazy in their house in their own way. I reacted to it by creating a series of videos on open source licensing. Um, there's a, at least a dozen of them there on, on general topics and also on some more specific topics. Um, so that's it for my um, prepared um, remarks. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Heather. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I want to ask the attendees if you have any more questions. You know, wait for a second. We also prepared a couple that came up quite a bit. Um, when people registered. So I might just ask you a few of them. Sure. Awesome. All right, we, we actually have one coming in. Are VCs primarily interested in the open core model projects as your license picker script <laughs> open source? Um, okay, so I would say, um, Open core isn't a bad approach if you want to get VCs interested. But I would say that if you want investors to be interested, the main thing is that you have a business model in mind. Like open core might be the right model for you, or it might be one of those other ones that I suggested, but you'll be a lot more successful getting interest from investors if you have mapped out how you're going to get to a profitable situation. And it, among you know business people, this is sometimes re referred to as conversion of customers. So it, when you release your open source code, you have a bunch of free customers, basically, your community who's using your code. And if everything works right, then there's a lot of word of mouth, you get lots of stars on GitHub, You know, people start downloading your code. And the question is then how do you convert those into paying customers? And that's what you need to explain to an investor. And it can be open core or it can be a lot of other stuff. Um, I would say that uh, in the infrastructure software area, things like database and uh, you know all those companies that you saw on that slide, um, that is usually a pretty good sector for open core. Um, but uh, but open core can work for lots of other things too. So I'd say uh, open core isn't a bad choice, but it, it might or might not be the right choice for you. Depending, it really depends a lot on your on your on your product and sector. Um, and is my license picker script open source? Yeah, I think I did release it on GitHub. I honestly don't remember um, because it probably has one star, and that was me, you know. But uh, I think I did release the license picker. Uh, so, you know, feel free to, uh, if you if you look at it and have a pull request, I'll try to figure out how to deal with it. 
but uh, God knows how I'll get it onto my website. Uh, but because uh, I'm not very good at that. But uh, but yeah, it's um it's it's a pretty simple script actually, and uh, the the main thing is like the questions and the logic, like the the programming itself is actually you know oh well I'm no great programmer so uh, um, of course when I was writing it it quickly got much more complicated than I thought it was going to be which is the way of all programs so um, uh, but yeah I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's on github um, Heather, can you talk a little bit maybe just historically and there, there seems to have been this is maybe a little bit settled out at this time, but <clears throat> kind of there became the the commons clause came out and certainly the stuff that with Elastic and a lot of, a lot of people who were hosting their things on AWS and then I'll call it different labeled versions of, of those solutions and kind of, do you feel like that's subtle? Do you feel like there's specific things people with services-based projects might want to think about as they go forward or? Just any comments about that kind of evolution? Yeah, first of all, so Commons Clause was kind of the progenitor of some of these source available licenses. I, most people don't use it anymore. I, I would maybe call it more like a thought experiment. It was an interesting idea, um, but um, it, it had some issues and most, most companies that used it decided to stop using it um, and in favor of the source available licenses. Um, so I, I wouldn't advise anybody to start with using that at this point. If, if you're interested in that, then you probably want to look at a source available license. And I would look at Polyform and, and those ones that were on the slides to see, you know, if any of the existing ones work for you. Because if if an existing one works, that's kind of better. Like uh, it's, it's an easier explanation. As I mentioned, the understanding tax is lower. Um, so uh, that's what you should be uh, looking for. Now, what happened with Elastic and Amazon, um, I was working on this, so I only mention um, you know, publicly available information, but um, uh, Amazon used, so Elastic had a, a core that was originally under a permissive open source license. I think it was Apache too. Um, and uh, and Amazon was using that to search to uh, to uh, serve up a, a service um, that they called I think they called it Elasticsearch or something similar to that. I don't actually remember the name that they used. Um, so first, Elastic changed their license so that Amazon couldn't do that anymore. Then they basically sued Amazon for trademark infringement because it was not that was not a question of whether the software could be used. It was a question of what it was called. And that is actually a huge issue. If you are um, thinking of commercializing a project, um, you really need to think about your branding because that can be at least as powerful a business tool as any license would be. It's actually probably much easier to sue someone for trademark infringement than for violation of one of these like nifty new open source like licenses, right? So what happened was um, Amazon took the code at the point where it was uh, available under an open source license and it forked the code and took it forward under a new name. And the party settled the lawsuit. Um, so that's where that stands now. Um, you know, there, there are issues when companies change their license midstream. And the thing about it is that, um, you know, companies sometimes need to change their licensing. What, what works, you know, when you're a small company doesn't work when you're a big public company, of, particularly if it's your main product. And so sometimes companies have to make decisions about license changes. When you make a decision that takes rights away, that can leave people high and dry. And so that, um, you know, that is something that needs to be done with a great deal of thought. You need to understand how not to alienate your community. Um, and, uh, and you need to give some notice for it and so forth. So 
uh, if, if you're changing from, say, a permissive license to a source available license or even permissive to copyleft, um, you have to be careful about how you do that. It's a lot easier to make a license decision coming out of the gate, um, and then people will accept it more. Um, and, and always, it's easier to change from a restrictive license to a less restrictive license rather than vice versa, because... Um, as as demonstrated in the elastic situation, you know, once you release under a permissive license, you can't take those rights away. So people can keep using the software under the old version. Most people will end up converting because they don't want to maintain the software on their own. But um, but it's also possible that somebody can take the uh, software and fork it and make it available separately. By the way, that has worked also uh, with um, Java, uh, which is an open source uh, product that's owned by Oracle. And, um, but Oracle has slowed down the, uh, the support for the open source version. And so another company took over, but that was a, a, you know, a ubiquitous product. So another company took over support of it. Um, and that's what will happen if, if the product is extremely popular. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, um, so there, there is some churn sometimes when there are licensing changes. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And if not, I'm going to ask one that came up um, quite a bit which is what are some best practices for machine learning algorithms that are released under an open source license? Oh my gosh, that is a big topic. <laughs> um, like really all I can say about that is that um, our law and our licensing practices have not even begun to absorb what is going on with machine learning. It is, it is a nightmare out there. Um, there are, there are many issues, and among them <laughs> are um, the fact that machine learning models are, are neither fish nor fowl. You know, they're, they're not really software, and they're not really, well, they're kind of data. <laughs> um, well, and there's certainly a lot of moving parts involved. There's like data that gets ingested, and sometimes that data is complex, like it might be photos, it might be information, you know, and all of the data that gets ingested has different sort of copyright properties. And then there's the software that creates a model. And then there's the model. And then there's usually a wrapper around the model for people to interface with it or change it. And um, one problem that's happened is that um, when, when you look at AI or ML and you ask, what are the licensing terms for this? People are extremely vague about all those different parts, you know? And um, I, I literally have, uh, I have clients in the AI space and I ask them, okay, you're telling me about this thing. What is it? <laughs> what does it consist of? And they have a hard time explaining it to me. I don't think it's because I'm stupid. I think it's just like, people really have a hard time articulating what it is we're talking about. And if you don't know what it is, it's kind of hard to figure out what licensing terms are appropriate for it. Um, also the, like the soft, the open source licenses, they're, they're written for software. They're not written for data. They're not written for photos. They're certainly not written for machine learning models. And when you read them overlaid on top of some of this stuff, they stop making sense very quickly, okay? Um, and there are not licenses for it. There, I think there's one license out there that's like a data license that says you can use this for machine learning, but um, there's nothing like, you know, an open machine learning license yet. And honestly, I'm not gonna be involved in writing that one because that's gonna take some work, right? Um, it, you know, Maybe people will get together and try to standardize on this, but it, that would be a huge and difficult effort in light of the, the you know, the breakneck pace of development. Um, one license that people might have seen is this new, I think it's Rail ML license. I might be 
mistaking the name of it, but that's not an open source license. It's a, what I call an ethos license. So it's like, here's, here's this stuff and you can't do anything um, uh, like unethical with it, which is definitely not open source. And that license itself is kind of scary to read <laughs> um, because as a lawyer, right? Because when you think about the risk management involved in using a license with those kinds of restrictions, you, you have nightmares about what litigation could look like. Oh, you use this to you know deprive people of their rights and uh and now uh we're gonna have a big public lawsuit about it it's like just gives lawyers shivers you know so um so there's a lot of complexity in the landscape there is there is no standardization at this point so we're all kind of muddling through at this point and the the best i can say is when you're dealing with issues like this try to put every all the pieces into buckets and figure out what works for licensing for each bucket don't try to put it all in one bucket because it just it just doesn't work licenses for software don't work for data and vice versa they're really quite different and uh and even asking what is source code is a difficult question once you get out of outside the realm of, of software I think Heather will bring you back for an entirely separate uh, webinar for data licensing. Oh my God. Because that, that's just a, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's data a world onto its own, right? Very interesting. I'm actually quite opinionated about it, but, uh, um, but it is, it is a, it's a, it's a tough area because of the lack of standardization and because of the massive amounts of data that are being ingested, particularly for ML. And an interesting one relative to the Fed's position on it and some things yeah. that are going on, especially as it relates to academics. There's some very interesting new uh, requirements coming down from NIH I, starting. I think January. we're going to see um, re regulation about that very soon, and that might obviate a lot of what might be going on in licenses. Um, I, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see regulation quickly. Um, the the EU is already you know, uh, I think released some new, I don't remember exactly the status of it, but uh, uh, in the US, um, I'm sure we will also be seeing new regulations or laws in that area. All right, so we are at time. So I just wanna close this up. Uh, thank you so much, Heather, uh, for joining us. This was such a privilege to have you and it was super informative. We did have a raffle for one of your books and Drew just ran a random number generator or pseudo random number generator. Yes. Um, and it was Yang Chao Ma. I will get in touch with you to figure out how to get the book to you. It's a really great read. It's the first book I read when I started this job. Um, so it's an excellent read. And then I also want to underline everything that Heather said and emphasize that, you know, our office helps support with things that are beyond just traditional commercialization. Uh, please reach out to us before um, you know you release your code on GitHub or before publishing because we can help you with strategizing around which open source licenses to pick, figuring out what your commercialization goals are. Even if you think you don't have any at present, that might change in the future. And it's never too early to reach out to us. Um, yeah. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to Drew or I, and I will have send you guys our contact information um, after this. Well, thanks very much. It was a pleasure to do this. And uh, um, if anyone has questions afterwards, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I, as I mentioned, that that email address doesn't work anymore, unfortunately, because I changed jobs. But, uh, but you can definitely find me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heather. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.